Hello, BookTube. I have some mail to go through with you, uh, but before I do that, I wanted to touch base and make sure that I should be doing that. Uh, I've fallen into the habit here of uh, just opening my mail on camera. <laughs> it's so much fun for me to get these books in the mail every day that it seems wrong not to share that. If I had you all here in town, I would certainly invite you over to open mail every day. Uh, but I want to make sure that you're getting some uh, the, the loathsome 21st century word is value out of it. Are you, are you, I want to make sure you're enjoying it. I've had lots of emails from people saying uh, that it helps them a lot, that it gives them an idea of what's coming, that it, they, you know, they can make all sorts of advanced decisions, sometimes months ahead of time, about what, what looks of interest and what doesn't. I want to make sure that's true for most of you, and that this just isn't tedium. I, I, I think about... <laughs> I think about it because I, 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 it's easy to fall into habits, especially if you enjoy them, and I do very much enjoy sharing these, the, the experience. I don't know what's in these packages, neither do you, so we find out together and we talk about them together. I want to make sure that that's okay, uh, but, uh, so feel free in the comments field to let me know if you like these. I'm assuming that you do, but uh, I, I, we, can, we have, Lord knows, no shortage of other things to talk about if you don't. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, let's, uh, let's look at the mail we've got here. Fairly good size shipment. We'll see, we'll see what is here of interest. Okay, all right, first one's from Basic Books, and I didn't request it. Uh, it comes out in October. It's by David Heidler and Gene Heidler, and it is The Rise of Andrew Jackson, Myth, Manipulation, and the Making of a Modern Politics. Uh, so that is right up my alley. Of course, Jackson is not one of my favorite presidents, but still, a, a new book on him, uh, certainly. I'll certainly take it. Uh, so Andrew Jackson was violent and prone to violence, uh, and well into his 40s, his sole claim to want the public's affection derived from his victory in a 30-minute battle at New Orleans in early 1815. Yet those of his immediate circle believed he was a great man who should be President of the United States. <laughs> All right. Angling towards modern residences here, I think. Uh, Jackson's election in 1828 is usually viewed as a result of the expansion of democracy. Historians David and Gene Heidler argue that he actually owed his victory to his closest supporters, who wrote hagiographies of him, uh, founded newspapers to savage his enemies, and built a national political network that was always on message. Yeah, definite. <laughs> and, and, of course, it doesn't hurt that the current president of the United States got rid of all the good president portraits in the Oval Office and put Jackson's portrait there. Uh, in transforming a difficult man into a paragon of democratic virtue, the Jacksonites exploded the old order and created a mode of electioneering that has been mimicked ever since. Okay, that, that sounds really good. It also sounds like uh, you were certainly not going to get a hagiography with this book, which is great. <laughs> I, I really can't stand any more hagiographies of old hickory. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's great. Strong presidential candidate for the uh, for reading in the fall. It's, it's starting to firm up. It's, it's always going to be downhill from 2016 when I got a gigantic spate of American... Oh, no, 2017, when there was an, an unprecedented number of presidential biographies. But I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll definitely take it. Oh, great. Okay, now we, do, we get one that I did request. Uh, so this comes out uh, in a month, July the 1st. And it's by Peter James. Uh, uh, and it's called Dead If You Don't. <laughs> when the tide rises, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> Okay, you actually can, but that's all right. Uh, so what have we got here? I'm hoping that this is going to be a paperback. No, no, it's going to be a $24, $25 hardcover. Uh, so that is the book. Very, very nice cover, and it's it's the it's good quality ARC, and the letters are embossed. I swear, Pan McMillan ought to bring it out like this <laughs> for $15. I think they would sell more copies. Uh, but anyway, uh, Kip Brown, successful businessman and compulsive gambler, is having the worst run of luck of his life. He's beginning to lose big style. However, taking his teenage son, Mungo, <laughs> for their club's Saturday afternoon football match should, give, should have given him a welcome respite, only, if only for a few days. But it, it's uh, at the stadium that his nightmare begins. Let me see if I can turn this with one hand. We'll find out what, what happens to poor Mungo. <laughs> uh, within minutes of arriving at the game, Kip bumps into a client. He takes his eyes off Mungo for a few moments, and in that time, the boy disappears. Then he gets the terrifying message that someone has his child, and to get him back alive, Kip will have to pay. Dead if you don't. 
thinking probably Mungo is being kept held somewhere near the water. <laughs> That's a, okay, so July the 1st, summer is a time for thrillers, so I'm all for it. Uh, let's, let's move on here. These mail halls tend to be uh, almost evenly divided between books that I did request and books that I didn't. Which is kind of strange. I like it very much. I'm not complaining. But Oh, great. Okay, here's a, a paperback uh, of Peter Brown's The Ransom of the Soul, which is subtitled Afterlife and Wealth in Early Western Christianity. I loved it. It's uh, this. I didn't think it would get a paperback, but it's, it's fantastic. And boy, does it have some major blurbs. <laughs> it's got G.W. Bowersock and uh, A.N. Wilson and Tom Holland. So they don't have any use for the likes of me. I reviewed it, but I'm not going to be blurbed in that kind of company. Uh, not even on the pub sheet. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. I'm glad to have the paperback because I know I don't have the hardcover anymore. Uh, the paperback comes out in mid-June. It's all about um, the problems that wealth caused for early Christians and also the advantages that it did. Quite a few of the earliest patrons of Christianity were wealthy people, uh, and including lots of wealthy women. Uh, and, and yet the subject itself could not be any clearer in, in the actual Gospels of Christianity. So you, you know, you're, you're at a crossroads right there, because you, you want to promulgate your, your new religion, you want it to do well, and you want it to prosper in all levels of society, but uh, the, the Messiah around whom your religion is built scorned wealth and instructed his followers to do the same. So that's pretty tricky. <laughs> and yet Christianity has managed from the beginning to live just fine with those injunctions. We have the prosperity gospel here in the United States that is nauseating the more you look at it, the sicker you get it in your stomach. And it allegedly is all built on Christianity. Every one of the people in those auditoriums praying for money would claim to be Christians. <laughs> so, uh, I, I would gladly reread the thing. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's move on. What's this next one? Oh, okay. Oh, great. This is the finished copy of something that we saw on this channel already. Uh, is this going to be June? Yes, this is, this is, uh, this is late June. And this is uh, Invisible Countries by Joshua Keating, Journeys to the Edge of Nationhood, all about uh, what is a country, while certain basic criteria, borders, a government, recognition from other countries, seem obvious. Journalist Joshua Keating's book explores exceptions to those rules including self-proclaimed countries uh, in, in like uh, Abkhazia, Kurdistan, Somaliland, and a Mohawk reservation straddling the U.S.-Canadian border. And I have this. I've had this for a while, and I haven't read it, even though it does strike me as very interesting. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to get to it. <laughs> June has started, so I'm, of course, calibrating everything again, all over again. This is a new month of reading, which is always fun. Uh, oh, Okay. I think we saw this before as well. Uh, this is a murder mystery, I believe. It's from Harper. It comes out uh, in October. Oh, no, we, I don't think we could have seen this. Uh, we may have seen the earlier one, the, the last one of this. This is this is by Antonio Manzini, uh, and it is, I don't know if you can, it's out of season. It's, it's a, a, another adventure of the deputy... Police Chief Rocco Chavoni. Uh, and the, the earlier ones were Black Run and Adam's Rib. I read Black Run and very much liked it. Uh, set in the bitterly cold Italian Alps of Aosta, this sly and engrossing crime novel opens with a girl's kidnapping gone wrong. When a blown tire causes a kidnapper's car to skid off the road, killing the driver and his accomplice on impact, Rocco is left with several questions. Who are these kidnappers, and what do they want with this poor girl? Was it about settling scores? A vendetta? How did the girl survive the crash? Is there another suspect secretly behind the car accident? I could swear we've already heard about this, but I don't see how it could be. This is the advanced copy of a book that doesn't come out until the autumn. So I don't think I would have got an earlier copy. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I don't think I read the second book in the series, so I'll have to, I'll have to check and see. I, don't, I think I only read the first one, thought it was really good, made a mental note to revisit this author, and now I get a chance. So that's great. And let's see, what is this? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. <laughs> uh, okay. Fantastic. 
Uh, I don't think I requested this, but I'm very happy to have it. This is by Adrian Tinniswood, and this is Behind the Throne. Uh, a Domestic History of the British Royal Household. And I love this author. I love Adrian Tinniswood. I think, I think the, the books are so good. But the last one was The Long Weekend. Um, about... I just I didn't it didn't work on me at all. It got reviewed everywhere. In fact, this thing probably has lots of blurbs for it, uh, but it just didn't work on me at all. Uh, so I'm, this and this is much more my kind of uh, of subject. So so uh, let's see here. Uh, well, here that's what it's going to look like. Uh, we've got uh, monarchs. They're just like us. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> uh, they entertain their friends and eat and worry about money. Henry VIII tripped over his dogs. George II threw his son out of the house. James I had to cut back on the alcohol bills. Uh, in Behind the Throne, historian Adrian Tinniswood uncovers the reality of five centuries of life at the English court, taking the reader on a remarkable journey from one Queen Elizabeth to another, and exploring life as it was lived by clerks and courtiers and clowns and crown heads, the power struggles and the petty rivalries, the tension between duty and desire. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. That's much more my line of country than, uh, than The Long Weekend was. Uh, of course, there have been many. This is due, I don't know if I mentioned, this is due in, in early October. I, there have been many, many, many books on this subject. Harold Nicholson did one. God, it must be 60 years ago. It was quite good. Uh, but I'm always up for another one. <laughs> there, we, there we have, uh, that is a print of a picture that has caused no end of trouble. <laughs> that is, because uh, the, the men are all identifiable. Some of the women are as well, but the men are all identifiable, and it's, it's, it's put fuel on the fire of Shakespearean authorship controversies, because, uh, because there's, a, there's a line where uh, someone who's alleged to be Shakespeare says that he helped to bear the canopy, and that's what that would mean, and that would make him one of these people, which, of course, you know, a Warwickshire playwright is not going to be one of those people, so, uh, but anyway, that, that's fantastic. It's short book, so it, it will deal, it will deal glancingly with six centuries of, of royal households, but that could still be really good. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, well, this is going to be a flashpoint for the month of June. Uh, this is the finished copy. Oh, my. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a flashpoint for the month of June. I suspect. I could be wrong. I have an advanced copy, and I haven't read it. Uh, this is Edouard Louis. This is The History of Violence uh, by the author of The End of Eddie, uh, which was a gay novel that was praised hysterically to the stars and back by every living thing with a pulse, except yours truly. <laughs> I thought it was not just bad, but utterly ridiculous. It was not just inept as, as writing, but it was embarrassing. And I seem to be the only person who felt that way anywhere in the world. I still stand by it, of course. I read the thing, same as anybody else. I don't know what people were thinking. I don't know what book they were seeing in the end of Eddie. This just wet wash of tedium from beginning to end. And that, of course, makes me wary about, about the history of violence. Uh, because this is, this is going to be another autobiographical novel. It was obvious in the end of Eddie that this author has no talent and cannot write other than what he has lived. And can't even write that very very interestingly. So he's never going to write anything except autobiographical fiction. And if you're going to do that, you bloody well better have a good autobiography. And he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't at all. He has just an ordinary autobiography. I mean, if if you have a a very young gay author and you take the gay away, and you're left with nothing, then that's bad. <laughs> That's very, very bad. That's a, career, a writing career that should not have happened. Uh, and, but, oh God, look at all the blurbs here. Jeez Louise, from every single person in the world. <sighs> Including lots of authors I really like. So we'll, uh, we'll just have to see. <laughs> now that I have it, it's definitely going to go on the immediate read. I'll have to read it this weekend because it's coming right up. And I'll need time to think about it. Uh, so the, the history of violence, history of violence by Edward Louis, the, the author of *The End of Eddie*. Uh, and we have a bunch of cardboard to deal with here, no boxes, uh, but good things can come in cardboard as well. Uh, let's see, I'll just make a pile of stuff on the side. Oh, fantastic! Okay, we saw this already. This is an Australian author, I believe. Uh, not an author I know well at all, although uh, just today, uh, yeah, an Australian author. Just today, I had. Um, Deb over. My old friend Deb came over to, to, to play with the puppy. 
Uh, and when she saw this book on my June shelf, she let out a gasp of of pleased surprise. Uh, apparently, he's he's good enough to have impressed her. Uh, so uh, this this comes out in June, I know. Yeah, all right, late June nineteenth. This is the finished copy of uh, The Shepherd's Hut by Tim Winton. Uh, which is, we saw the advanced copy of this. Uh, the plot summary, Jackie Clacton dreads going home. His mother is dead, his father beats him relentlessly, and he wishes he were an orphan. But no one's ever told Clacton to be careful what he wishes for. In The Shepherd's Hut, Tim Winton, Australia's most decorated and beloved novelist, crafts the story of Jaxie, a brutalized rural youth who flees from the scene of his father's violent death and strikes out in the vast wilds of Western Australia, where I have never been. I don't know how vast they are, I don't know how wild they are. Never been there. Uh, all he carries with him is a rifle and a water jug. All he wants is peace and freedom. But surviving in the harsh salt lands alone is a savage business. Those of you who are in Australia, have you visited the salt lands? What are they like? Are they really bad? I've never been there. Never walked a single inch. Uh, and once he discovers he's not alone out there, all Jaxie's plans go awry. He meets a fellow exile, a ruined priest, a man he's never certain he can trust, but on whom his life will soon depend. And this book is the thrilling tale of an unlikely friendship and yearning, at once brutal and lyrical, from one of our finest storytellers. So I, I asked when I got the advanced copy of this if that jives with what those of you who are in Australia know. Is he considered one of your finest storytellers? I had uh, some mixed reactions. Uh, I gotta confess, of course, it's not fair to him, but I'm every bit as curious about the Saltlands as I am about his book. Because <laughs> uh, it's so enticing, it's so weird to encounter in one of these mail halls or any other video or anywhere else in life, to encounter tales about the place I've never been. I can't call it up in my memory. I can only call up what I've read about it. Whereas every other, everything else, every other place you mention, I can call it up in my memory in addition to what I read about it. But Australia is this big blank spot. It's, it's, a, it's a gigantic island with a ring of beautiful places around the very edge, an inhospitable Marscape in the middle, and tons of dogs that I've never met. An entire species of dog on Earth that I've never met. <laughs> But anyway, let's see. Oh, fantastic. Oh, boy. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, oh, my. Okay, this comes out in October. This is Godsend, uh, a novel by John Ray. That is what the cover is going to look like. Those of you who know John Ray will notice the similarity immediately between this cover and Low Boy, a great novel that he wrote years and years ago. Uh, oh boy, I loved Low Boy. <laughs> this, this, uh, let's see, in November 2001, a 20-year-old American man was detained by the U.S. forces after a prison uprising near Mazar al sharif in northern Afghanistan. John Walker Lynn, known to the world as an American Taliban, was eventually sentenced to 20 years in prison. He apologized to the court for fighting alongside the Taliban, saying, quote, that he had realized that what I now know I never would have joined them. If I knew now what I what I if I'd known then what I know now, he would never have joined them. His parents, residents of an affluent community in Marin County, California, confessed themselves at an utter loss as to what had led their son so far astray. Thirteen years later, traveling through Afghanistan for Esquire magazine in search of people who had known and fought with Lynn, John Ray was astonished to hear repeated rumors of another American who had taken up arms in the conflict. A woman, according to some, even a girl. What he learned would form the basis for his fifth novel, Godsend, which follows two American teenagers, a boy named Decker and a girl named Aiden, as they journey to Pakistan to study the Quran at a madrasa. In order to travel and study freely, uh, Aiden creates a new identity for herself, that of a young student of scripture named Suleiman, painfully shy and devoted to Islam. She has traveled 7,000 miles to escape her small town, California, past and the intolerance of her father and mother, whose marriage was recently crumbled. In a brief while, she succeeds in reinventing herself, living as Suleiman, in the high-walled madrasa, a stone's throw from the troubled Afghan border. But it is only a matter of time, she knows, before her deception is uncovered. <sighs> okay. Fantastic. Uh, I can't wait. I, I can't wait. I don't, in fact, I don't literally know if I will wait. 
this this doesn't come out until early October. Under normal circumstances, I would wait until September. In fact, I would wait, as you know, if you watch these tedious mail hauls, I would wait until I got the finished copy, and that would be the kick in the pants to, to read it. But I don't know if I can wait. John Ray is one of my favorite. Low Boy is a great novel. I I, I might dip in early. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's let's move on. Here. What is this next one? Uh, oh, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is a finished copy of something we saw before. This is uh, uh, this is by Alexandra Silber, and it is White Hot Grief Parade. Uh, Alexandra Al Silber seems to have everything, brilliance, beauty, and talent in spades. But when her beloved father dies after a decade-long battle with cancer, when she is just a teenager, it feels like the end of everything. Lost in grief, Al and her mother hardly know where to begin with the rest of their lives. Into this grieving house bursts Al's three friends from theater camp, determined to help out as only drama students know how, and they're moving in for the duration. Uh, and this is, uh, the, the publisher's sheet here calls it an ode to the restorative power of family and friendship. And it comes out in July. I haven't, I haven't even read the advanced copy that I have. Uh, but it's a memoir by Alexandra Silver. That is Alexandra Silver. Uh, and I remember being being uh, slightly taken aback by how incredibly young she is to write a memoir. But uh, memoirs are based on the experience, not the age of the writer. So uh, it could still be very moving. I certainly have read my share that were. So. But still, it's June the 1st. So I probably won't be getting to it for a couple of weeks, at least. Uh, oh, fantastic. All right, this is a June. This is a June book. I was wondering if I was even going to get a finished copy of this. It looks really interesting, but I haven't got to it. All these June books that I haven't got to, I don't know what I was doing in May. Uh, this comes out in late June. I will do this this weekend. Uh, this is the finished copy of Nick Tyenson's Spying on Whales. That is the finished copy. It looks just like the advanced copy. Uh, let's see here. From Moby Dick to Free Willy to Blackfish, whales have long intrigued us. They are among the largest, most intelligent, deepest diving species to have ever lived on our planet. They seem almost too majestic, too fantastical to be believed. They evolved from land-roaming creatures the size of German shepherds into animals that move like fish, breathe like us, can grow to 300,000 pounds, and live 200 years and travel entire ocean basins. Whales fill us with awe, terror, and affection. But because they live 99% of their lives underwater, they remain mysteries to us. It's, a, it's always an awe-inspiring moment if you're out on the water, especially if you're in a low craft, something something wind-driven, so you're right on the water. It's an awe-inspiring experience when one of them stops by. <laughs> and by awe-inspiring, I mean it in the Old Testament way of both good and very much bad. <laughs> you are you are stricken with awe. That used to be the phrase uh, when, when our forefathers considered that awe was not necessarily a purely good thing. When things, if you said something was awesome... You weren't necessarily praising the experience. That's definitely the case. When you're in a, a skiff, when you're in a single-person vessel, you know, one, the tiller under your elbow, one sail, only you and your dogs, and a whale shows up. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, in this book, the author takes readers to the ends of the earth and the cutting edge of research to answer some of our biggest questions about whales. How and why did they evolve to such enormous sizes? How did their ancestors return? from land to the sea? What do their lives tell us about our oceans and about evolution as a whole? How have hundreds of years of whaling affected their population, and what does climate change mean for their survival? And believe it or not, I haven't got to this. Just disgraceful. I should read this right away. I will. I will read this this weekend. Uh, I can't believe it's been sitting there this whole time. I haven't done it. Um, and the effect on, of their population on, on of whaling should be pretty obvious. <laughs> I, I, uh, but I will see. Maybe this author has new things to tell me. Uh, I I did a, a long paper once in school on the effect of warfare on whales. The effect of, of World War One and World War Two. The world wars on whales. And I remember I had to propose it to, uh, to the head of the department. And I, I went to, we sat down, and I said, well, I'd like to do is a long, detailed paper on the effect of world wars on whales. And he said, oh, yes, very interesting things, right on the British border, so crucial. I said, no, no, 
<laughs> no, no, no. Not W A L E S. W H A L E S. <laughs> on the, the effect of world wars on the animals that live in the ocean. He was, he was, he, the look on his face was like that was the very first time in his entire 62 years that he'd ever heard that there were such a thing as whales. The oceans have animals in them. <laughs> Uh, but I got to do it. I did a lot of archival research, and it was a lot of fun. And, of course, you could guess what the answer is, the simple answer. Warfare is very good for whales, because when humans are busy killing each other, they, they spend less time killing whales. <laughs> so, uh, 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 I stopped a little short of recommending perpetual war. <laughs> Didn't want to seem anti uh, misogynistic or misanthropic. Uh, let's see. All right, this is, believe it or not, this is our last one. We're almost done here. Uh, and this is also something I did not request. What an odd cover. Uh, this is uh, this is due in October. It's by John Lindquist, and it is I Am Behind You. And that is a, a camper, a, a streamer, a Gulfstream camper, upside down with a flock of birds. Isn't that odd? How immediately arresting. Oh, hey, let's gaze on that while I, uh, let's see here. So uh, he came to fame with his debut novel, Let the Right One In. Wasn't that made into a movie? I seem to remember hearing about that. Uh, an instant bestseller in Sweden, his book enjoyed two successful film adaptations. Okay. Uh, the latest novel from the author of the Washington Post called Sweden's Stephen King <laughs> uh, is I Am Behind You, which begins with a creeping sense of unease before barreling forward towards outright horror as the characters attempt to understand the strange place to which they have been brought and are pushed closer to their breaking points. Four families wake up one morning in their trailer, hence the cover, uh, to an ordinary campsite. However, during the night, something strange has happened. Everything outside the camping grounds has disappeared, and the world has been transformed into an endless expanse of grass. The sky is blue, but there is no sign of the sun. There are no trees, no flowers, no birds. And every radio plays nothing but songs of 60s pop icon Pete Peter Hemmelstrand. As the holiday makers try to come to terms with what has happened, they are forced to confront their deepest fears and secret desires. Past events that each of them has tried to bury rise to the surface and take on terrifying physical forms. Can any of them find a way back to reality? That sounds awesome. <laughs> okay, that sounds just awesome. I am behind you. Okay, <laughs> I never know what I'm going to get. Uh, so that's horror. That's horror fiction. So we've got uh, I Am Behind You by Swe Sweden's Stephen King. Uh, spying on whales. All that we can learn about them. It's, it's not a lot. We, we can kill them a lot easier than we can study them. Uh, White Hot Grief Parade. Uh, memoir by a very young woman. And uh, God Sent by the great John Ray. I strongly advise you all to borrow Lowboy from the library and read it, you will really like it. Uh, the Shepherd's Hut by Tim Winton, that Australian treasure. Uh, History of Violence by Edward Louis, apparently a literary treasure of the current gay world. Uh, he's cubic zirconium. <laughs> so beware. Uh, then uh, Behind the Throne by Adrian Tinniswood, a historian I very much like. Out of Season by Antonio Mazzini, a, a police procedural. Uh, invisible countries uh, about what makes a country, what what you have to do or be or try to be a country. Uh, Ransom of the Soul in paperback, a really good, searchingly intelligent book about the relationship between early Christianity and money. Uh, Peter James, Dead If You Don't, uh, second of two books on our list here who are, that, is, that are about a missing child. Uh, and The Rise of Andrew Jackson uh, about... Uh, a rabble-rousing president, it looks like this is going to take a little bit of wind out of his sails, which would be nice. <laughs> so that was not a bad little mail adventure. I had fun. I can't wait to dig into some of these things. Uh, but the key here is, did you have fun? <laughs> so be sure to remember, I mean, in addition to all the comments about what looks interesting or what doesn't, uh, be sure to let me know if, you know, just to touch base. We haven't done it in a long time. Let me know if these are okay to constantly go through my mail with you I, I, one way or another i'd be happy to hear it uh and I'll, I'll wrap this up for now uh but i'll be back soon thank you book two <laughs>